fill me and every inch of this room with the spirit of truth. That you may be glorified, God, by the words that are spoken, by the attitudes, by the examples. Father, accept this as our worship to you as we learn your word and are taught by the ever-presence of your Holy Spirit in this place today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Calvary. I understand it's been a little quiet for the last month because it's some, some jabroni named Pastor Chet's been gone, visiting around for a while. I've been gone for a month, enjoying a sabbatical. I, uh, I was able to spend 15 days uh, in South Georgia with my mother and my pop. Uh, yes, I, I did indulge in uh, hunting and fishing and eating and loving and fellowshipping. And did I mention hunting and fishing and eating? It was phenomenal. Uh, we, we got to uh, just share some good family time and prayer time and encourage uh, uh, family that was there. But I got to tell you, when we, my daughter came and joined me for the last five days, my daughter Caitlin came and joined us for the last five days. And some of you that follow us on Facebook saw the videos. And, and regardless of what my youngest daughter says, they're all my favorite children, just whichever I'm with at the time, right? So y'all can identify with that. Uh, but, but when we rounded that curve and hit 95, coming out of Vegas, and you see all that big open desert space that's there, I knew I was back home. Uh, you know, I love Georgia. I grew up in Georgia. I been, spent 44 years in South Georgia. But this is home, and you are my family, and I love being back with family. I just got to tell you. Woo! I was challenged with praying and resting up and focusing on next steps. So I'm ready to embark on the next 10 years, if God permits, of life change here at Calvary. And uh, I just want you to help me journey as we spend the next few minutes looking at Christmas dedication. We're winding up a four-week series on, on Christmas and all that that encompasses. And one of my favorite holiday stories is a Christmas carol. Um, where a shrewd businessman is visited by and, and challenged to reconcile his life with uh, past, present, and future ghosts that visit him in a dream. And today, I, I'd, I'd like for us to journey through what I call the three R's of life. Now, if, if you're 50 or older in this room and I ask you what the three R's of life where you're going to tell me reading, writing, and I, forgive me English teachers, arithmetic. Not arithmetic, but arithmetic. But that's not the three R's that we're not going to talk about reading, writing, and arithmetic today. We're going to talk about three other R's that I believe can change our lives if we'll allow God to do so. You, you notice I used the word change. Because he changes one of the core values that we have at Calvary. We believe that it is impossible to follow Jesus Christ and stay the same. Say that with me. I believe that it is impossible to follow Jesus Christ and stay the same. What you just described was change. So let's journey for a few moments as we look at life change and reflection. Our past. Our reflection. This time last year, I was standing before you saying 2013 and it's coming to an end. If you haven't gotten things done, you have a little bit of time. And 2014 is ahead of you and challenged you to make some resolutions. Did any of you make resolutions in, for 2014? To, one of you. It's bold, three of you. Five of you is bold enough. You made a resolution not to make resolutions, I guess. Now, let's just be honest. Some of us have chosen not to make resolutions. I've got a little secret for you. Let me tell you how resolutions really work. If you really want them to work, if you want to lose weight, say you're going to gain weight. You'll lose it. Just the opposite of whatever you want to do. Psychologically, maybe it'll work. It worked for me. Some of you may have said, I want to improve my health for 2014. And you've done some things to improve your health. Some of you said, hey, for the first time, I'd like to read 
through the Bible, from Genesis all the way through Revelation. I would like to do that, and you've accomplished that. Some of you said, hey, I would like to join a life group. I've been hearing you talk about sharing life together, and I'd like to join a life group. Some of you have been in a life group, and you're not particularly crazy about the way your leader leads, and so you say, I could do a better job. And so you came and saw me and said, hey, can I lead a life group? And I said, I don't know, can you? I'll give you the opportunity. Maybe some of you have taken that step and said, hey, I would love to lead a life group. Maybe some of you attended our Financial Peace University, which, by the way, is going to be starting up again in January, and you said, I want to be a better steward with my funds. And you were able to accomplish that in 2014. But there, along the way of 2014, was what I call life events. Life happens, and life change happens. There we are, back to the C word again, change. And what does that stand for? It is impossible to follow Jesus Christ and stay the same. I want you to walk out of here understanding that God truly wants to have a more intimate relationship with every single one of us, whatever that looks like, for and to you. The reason why I want us to spend some time in reflection is to evaluate where we are in the present. Was there... A life event in 2014 that God used to change your perspective on his direction for you. Notice I said his perspective for you. Life change. Change is one of those core values that we've already talked about. We believe that it is what? Impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. In my reflection, I realized that such an event helped reshape, and I literally mean reshape Chet's life. February the 2nd, Super Bowl Sunday, 2014, getting ready for the big game. My phone rang, and I didn't make it to the phone, but there was a message that was left on my phone, and it was from my mother, and the message went something like this. Hi, Chet. Sorry to call you this way. Sorry to give you this kind of information. We are on our way to Atlanta, Georgia where I received a 911 phone call that's letting me know your sister has had a heart attack, and I don't think she made it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that's not real fun news to get on Super Bowl Sunday. That's not real good news to get on any Sunday. Even knowing that my sister had a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, I didn't want to hear that my 56-year-old sister was no longer here on this earth. She was in the presence of our Holy Father. And that caused me to begin thinking in February as I went back and as I met family members and we shared at the funeral, that caused me to start thinking and asking some questions. Uncle Phil, by the way, how, how old was Granddaddy Martin when he had his heart attack and passed away? He, he was 48. Hmm. Mom, I'm, I'm remembering this right. Dad was 57 when he had his heart attack passed away, right? Yeah, that's right, son. Now, sister, 56. You know, I began having that conversation, and I came to a realization. I was at that time 53 years old, approaching 54 years of age, and looked at my statue in the mirror and realized that if I wanted to see my grandchildren, and I would say this, if I want to see my grandchildren graduate from college, not knowing at that time, however, that at this time I could stand here and tell you that April, the first week in April, little Anderson Michael, my first grandson, is due to be born. And I wanted to increase my chances of seeing little Andy graduate from college. And so I began making some lifestyle changes for Chet. As a result... Let me give you a report. I started out this journey at 286 pounds. Currently, I got down to 263 pounds. Yay! I wasn't asking for you to do that. I was cheering for myself. My A1C, for those of you who are familiar with A1Cs and what that means, was a robust 7.2. Yeah, wow. Those of you who actually know what that means, did the little wow thing currently, it's down to 5.9. 
My overall cholesterol level was about 170, which is, you know, it's not really that bad. But taking into consideration, there's not many Andersons that lived to be 60 years of age, 48, 57, 56, and me fast coming on that age. I needed to get that down as well. And through medication and through some help from, from folks that chose to invest in Chet, it's down to about 90 right now. So overall, my, my health report card is good. And it kind of reminded me, well, okay, well, I got this whole eating thing and habit under. I needed to do some increase in exercise. <laughs> and in the 80s, there was this program, and some of you may have bought into it. Some of you may even remember, because I like activity and thinking that I'm getting something done, you know, uh, sweating to the oldies. Y'all remember that? Sweating to the oldies, you know, and you would dance and you would go, and, and Richard Simmons looked so funny when he was doing all of that. But anyway, apparently he got the weight off. Well, my daughter introduced me to a, a song, a chorus. Because I, you know I'm all about that bass, about that bass, no trouble. I'm all about that bass, about that bass, no trouble. I'm all about that bass, about that bass, no trouble. I'm all about that bass, about that bass. I gotta tell you, <laughs> you can't hear that song and not get to moving, right? I mean, you with me? And here, here is the deal. If you don't like that, there's so many parodies, and I came up with one actually last night. I'm all about that faith, about that faith. No devil. I'm all about that faith, about that faith. No devil. So we can spend our life focusing in on our faith. And if you just play that a half a dozen times, just the chorus now. Don't go past the chorus. I'm just going to warn you. Just the chorus. I got to tell you, I believe that that would get you excited enough to start moving and maybe be bold enough to walk through the gym door and start doing some real workout, right? But at least it was a start. It was a lifestyle change because what worked in the 80s for Chet wasn't working in the 2000s. And Chet needed to make some changes. We're back to that C word again. Remember, it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. And so Chet needed to change, and I couldn't do it by myself. So... I was surrounded, just like in the story that we're about to read, in Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, open to Luke chapter 2. You see, there was an event that had happened. A child had been born. Angels had appeared and proclaimed what his name was. And eight days later, we come to an event that I believe was a catalyst for life change. And I want to read that, and let's share just a little bit as we journey, as we come to a realization, a realization, the second R, the present of who and where we are now, of what life can be like. Starting in verse 21, and at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angels before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came, for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took up the child in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation and you have prepared in the presence of all people 
a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. You see, tradition of the law was to dedicate your firstborn son to the Lord. Now, this wasn't just any ordinary firstborn son, was it? This was an immaculate conception. This was the Messiah. And on the eighth day, they brought him to the temple, and his name was Jesus. But there was a man. And if you'll notice, if you study Scripture, Simeon's name is put in right here. But it's not talked about anywhere else. And so sometimes you begin wondering, I don't know, I do begin wondering, wait a minute. Why would just this one account of this one guy be so important? I believe that this account is so significant on obedience that we want to talk about it today. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. And as a result, the parents, out of obedience, Joseph and Mary, being obedient to the law that had been set apart, brought their child to the temple to offer a sacrifice for him. Now, the sacrifice was supposed to have been a yearling lamb. But if you could not afford a yearling lamb, you could offer doves or pigeons which lets us know the social status of where Joseph and Mary actually were. They didn't have the proceeds. And sometimes we would say, I just can't give, Lord, because I just don't have it. God made a provision. God made a provision for Joseph and Mary to say, hey, here's our child, and here is the sacrifice we want to offer on his behalf. And this one called a righteous man named Simeon declares it caused a proclamation. He had come to the realization that this baby, this eight-day-old baby that he was performing the circumcision on was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He said, he declared, okay, God, I'm good. I can die now because I have seen prophecy fulfilled. What prophecy? The angels had been proclaiming that a Messiah was to be born. The nation was looking for a Messiah. Now, unfortunately, most of them were looking for a conquering king. They were looking for someone to come riding in. And through war, they were looking. They didn't realize it was going to come in the form of humility, a savior. A Savior who at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. But understand, he's only eight days old at this time. The New Testament movement hadn't really begun. All they knew was there was a Messiah that was born. And this one, Simeon, realized out of an act of obedience... From Joseph and Mary, that he was in the presence of the Savior. Wow, the Messiah. And he truly believed that he was the Messiah. He came after reflecting, God, don't let me die. After realizing this is the Savior, that these prophecies had been fulfilled. And in verse 32, Jesus was given as a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Can you say us? Say it again, us. We're Gentiles, folks. Jesus was given for every one of us for the forgiveness of our sins, to make it possible for me to have a conversation one-on-one with the Holy Father. Jesus in that presence. Now, who is this Jesus that we're talking about here? I want to make it really clear because sometimes we come, especially with all of the decorations and the plays and baby Jesus is laying in the manger and some of us leave baby Jesus in that manger. Can I tell you, baby Jesus grows up to be a 33-year-old man. 
He doesn't stay in the manger. He is the second part of the Trinity. We believe that there is one God revealed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was falsely accused, was crucified, died, was buried. And on the third day, he arose and appeared to Mary and Martha and others. And he ascended into heaven and he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. We believe that salvation is only through faith in Jesus Christ and that every single one of us are sinners and need the grace of God. And salvation only comes through our acceptance of Jesus Christ, this proclamation. You see, Simeon believed because he witnessed an obedient act in someone's life. It was fulfilled to him. Jesus was given. And as we continue on, as we look toward the future and this Calvary carol that we've been talking about, it's a reminder, a reinforcement of our future. It's an opportunity for us to look at the third R, rededication of our lives. You see, the mission of Calvary Baptist Church is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. I just described who Jesus Christ was. We do that two ways, by the love of his people and the truth of his word. Sharing the love, sharing the truth of his word. That's our mission. That's why Calvary exists. And in 2014, some of you made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ and was baptized. Hallelujah, celebratory time. Some of you said, in 2014, I'm going to do things different, but you didn't. I could have continued in the state that I was. I firmly believe that I am increasing my chances. First of all, are seeing little Andy born. Second of all, I'm claiming that I want to see that young man walk across a stage and receive his doctorate degree in whatever it is that God calls him to do in the B. I want to do my part. I want to be obedient to God in doing that. And some of you made commitments in 2014. I've got good news for you. Some of you made those commitments and you accomplished them. Congratulations. Some of you made commitments, and I just hit a sore spot with you. You just turned me off because you said, oh, my goodness. This time last year, I said I was going to do this, and I didn't do it. Can I encourage you that 2014 is not completely over? <laughs> Especially if you committed to, like, 10 minutes of exercise a day. You probably got enough time to get that exercise in <laughs> if you take a 10-minute break each hour. Now, I didn't say anything about sleep, but you may have enough time. But in all seriousness, there may have been a phone call that you committed to making and you haven't made that phone call. Can I encourage you to make it? There may have been a step of faith that you said, hey, I'm going to step out on faith for the first time in my life. I'm going to surrender my life. I am truly going to trust God with my finances. And you surrendered your finances to God. Some of you said, you know, my health is really bad. I am going to trust God and I'm going to surround myself with people. It won't let me keep blowing them off. I'm going to make that step where well, you can start now. But here's the big thing that I really want you to hear. In that rededication process, it's not about the list that's this long. You see, I'm a type A personality, and I need to check off everything on the list. I'll even make a list so I can go back and check it off. Anybody else that way? Yeah, because that is such a sense of accomplishment. And it really is. A little insane, but it's still okay. I'm challenging you to look at your life and look at God and ask God what one act of obedience would you have me commit to in 2015 that would lead a friend a family member a business associate an enemy a neighbor 
someone to a life-changing relationship with you, God. What one act, God, one act can I commit to? What one act of obedience? Because as a result of one act of obedience 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Simeon. Wow. Wouldn't it be wonderful 2,000 years from now if someone's talking about an act that you committed because you were obedient to God? Not 20 acts, one act. One act of obedience. This may be the year, 2015, that you say, hey, I'm giving up nicotine. This may be the year you say, I'm going to be sober from January 1st through December the 31st, period. God, and I can't do it by myself, and I need your Holy Spirit. God, I'm going to commit to being baptized. I've been afraid to get up there. I've been afraid to tell other folks in the congregation that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but I am no longer. God, if you'll give me the strength, I'll commit to that. Those may be some of the things. You may want to commit to being involved in a life group or leading a life group. Whatever that commitment is, I'm asking you to be obedient to what it is that God asked you to be. So here's the final. Will you ponder the past today? We just look through your past today. Will you reflect today to help evaluate the present and take a leap of faith in 2015 to bring light and glory to your future and those that you encounter in 2015? That's my prayer for us today. Father, thank you that you give me the strength, that you give me the courage, just, Lord, just to confess who and what I am in you. Apart from you, I'm absolutely nothing. God, it's your word of truth that changes lives. I can't follow you and stay the same. Father, there are others in this room that have been playing the game, so... Help them get serious about that one commitment that you'd have them to make. Maybe it's to change their life. Father, hopefully it's to change the lives of those that they encounter. The same way Joseph and Mary changed Simeon's life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand and continue to worship with us?